A purely competitive industry has the following attributes. There are many firms, all the firms are small, the firms produce a homogeneous product, and there's free entry and exit to and from the industry. Many firms simply means many in relation to the number of consumers. The term is not so much a statement of quantity as it is a statement of the quality of the interactions of consumers and producers. Small means that a single firm's unit sales is small in comparison to the unit sales of the industry as a whole. Homogeneous means that consumers perceive that the output of one firm in the industry is identical to the output of every other firm in the industry. Whether or not the outputs of the various firms are objectively identical is irrelevant. It's only important that consumers believe that the outputs of all the firms are identical. Two products might be objectively identical in every way, and yet consumers believe them to be different. For example, name brands and generic products. They're often produced by the same firm. If consumers believe that two products are different, regardless of the fact that they are identical, the products are, from the consumer's perspectives, heterogeneous. Conversely, two products might be objectively different, and yet consumers believe them to be the same. For example, premium gas and regular gas. If consumers believe two products are the same, regardless of the fact that they are different, the products are, from the consumer's perspectives, homogeneous. Free entry and exit to the industry means that firms that are producing a different product in another industry, or entrepreneurs who are starting up new firms, are free to move into this industry and begin producing this product at any time and without artificially imposed cost. Also, firms in this industry are free to leave it and move to a different industry or to shut down at any time and without artificially imposed cost. Of course, there are startup costs to entering an industry and shutdown costs to leaving an industry. To open a restaurant, an entrepreneur has to purchase or rent building machinery and furniture and advertise. To shut down, the owner has to expend money and effort to find a buyer or perhaps renovate the property to the buyer's specifications. These are natural costs associated with entering and leaving an industry. Artificial costs are imposed by government regulation or existing firms or a combination of the two, which we call crony capitalism. For example, existing firms might lobby the government to require you to obtain a license to braid hair or to sell flowers or to landscape. We're told that the reason for the regulation is to protect the consumer, but in fact the larger effect is to prevent competition to existing firms. Many firms and homogeneous product imply that a single firm in this industry cannot charge a higher price for its product than its competitors charge. If a single firm tries to charge more than its competitors, no one will buy from the firm because there are many other firms from which to buy and the output of all those firms is identical to this firm's output. One might argue that while there are many firms, if the firms are spread out over a large area, consumers might have to pay the single firm's higher price because consumers cannot get easily from one place to another. This argument, however, violates the concept of many firms. By spreading the firms out over a large area, there are now fewer firms available to any given consumer. So from the consumer's perspective, there are no longer many firms. One might argue that a single firm could get away with charging a little bit more if its product were of a higher quality than those of the other firms. But this violates the concept of homogeneous product. By there being many firms and their products being homogeneous, no single firm will charge more than its competitors charge. Because the firms are small, a single firm will not charge less than its competitors. Think about it. The only reason a firm would lower its price is so that it can sell more units. But since the firm is small compared to the market, if it wants to sell more units, all it has to do is produce them. If the firm cannot charge more than its competitors, and it will not charge less than its competitors, then we say that the firm is a price taker. A price taking firm cannot control the price of its product. In the short run, it's possible that a firm might have some control over the price of its product if consumers are unaware of the prices its competitors are charging. For example, if you always shop at the same grocery store,
the grocery store could get away with charging a higher price for milk than its competitors because since you don't go to the other stores, you aren't aware of what the competitors charge. However, the store won't be able to get away with this forever. Eventually, you'll find out that the store charges more for milk than the other stores. Maybe because you make an out-of-the-ordinary stop at a competitor's store, or maybe because you talk to someone who shops elsewhere, or maybe because you saw an ad for the competing store's prices. If consumers and producers always have full information about prices in the market, we say that the industry is not merely purely competitive, it's perfectly competitive. It's important to understand pure and perfect competition, I think, to, to disabuse students of misconceptions they have when they come into the classroom. Um, students generally haven't had any business experience, and so their concept of a business is really the concept of, of businesses that almost don't exist. That is, these huge monolithic monopolies that could charge whatever they want, right? Students tend to have the impression that all businesses are that, when in fact very, very few businesses are, the, are, are that. Most businesses, find themselves in an environment like, like that of the price takers. They can't control the price of their product. Now that sounds weird to students because you, know, you say, well, I can charge whatever I want for my product. Yeah, you can ask whatever price you want, but that's not what we mean and that's not what's important. What's important is will the customer pay the price you're asking? If the customer will only pay the price you're asking if your price matches that of all your competitors, then we say that you're a price taker. And when we start to see firms from the perspective of price takers, which many of them are, we start to understand that firms are not these, generally speaking, not these monolithic things that just extract profit from the economy, but rather they tend to be very lean organizations. They're looking to generate you know, as much um, value as they can for their customers on very thin profit margins.